So today's topic is a serious one. Um, I'll be talking about it in evolutionary terms, but um, the evolutionary terms uh, come home. And uh, uh, let me begin by uh, addressing a question or, or launching a question asked by England's first feminist, as she was often known, Mary Estelle. If all men are born free, how is it that all women are born slaves? Because Enlightenment thinking purportedly brought freedom to everybody. And what she was saying is, well, from a woman's point of view, it didn't feel like that. I'll just briefly remind you of what I said yesterday. I'll introduce you to those who weren't here yesterday. Uh, yesterday's uh, challenge was to think about how a human that at one point, it could have been in theory pre-human, it could have been pre-homo, uh, turned from being a, a non-groupish species into one that was both groupish and selfish, where groupish means uh, adopting behaviors that uh, have, at first glance, a self-sacrificial content. And I contextualize this by emphasizing that in uh, species of old world monkeys and apes, there is invariably in social groups an alpha male, and the alpha male is a problem. If you look at the left-hand column here, uh, you see uh, an index, uh, an arrow showing that uh, <clears throat> we can organize individual males uh, by their ability to win mates or resources by using violence. And this is a strong predictor of genetic fitness, in other words, the evolutionary success. And so in the middle rank, you see in the middle column, you see in non-human primates, uh, you almost always have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on, uh, organized in pretty much a linear hierarchy. And that means that alpha male behavior is favored by natural selection. But in humans, we have something different. We have uh, something uh, more like an egalitarian structure, uh, but not all the males necessarily in the top rank, and there may be uh, gamma males below the, the beta males who are cooperating. Okay, so in humans, we have this egalitarian set of relationships among males. Uh, there are leaders in some societies, of course, that complicates things. And what I suggested is that uh, what we have in humans is a, a special situation as a result of an event which we can tie, I think, to around 300,000 years ago, a little bit earlier, actually, um, which meant that probably as a result of language getting sufficiently sophisticated, individuals were able to get sufficient trust in each other to kill the most intimidating individual in the group because he was taking the resources from other males. And in killing that, then a number of different things happened. So on the top row here, I drew attention to uh, the evidence for self-domestication in humans, defined as the reduction in reactive aggression, the propensity for reactive aggression. And then in the next row down, we see that once you have a male alliance gaining the power to kill anyone, then that alliance is in a position to set group norms that will benefit the alliance. And that can go in two ways by rewarding prosociality and punishing antisociality, you can get groupishness that is unique among the primates. You can argue whether or not groupishness occurs in social insects. Um, and on the bottom line uh, is the topic that I want to talk about today, uh, societal patriarchy, where the idea is that the alliance is able to set norms that are not necessarily beneficial for everybody in the larger group, but only for the group themselves, of the individuals who are setting the norms, uh, so that females and males outside the alliance are going to be dominated, and that is what you would characterize as societal patriarchy. And I saw this logic without knowing much about patriarchy, and then what I want to tell you today is the story of what I found uh, after thinking about uh, this uh, dynamic. So I'll organize it by, first of all, 
defining what I mean by societal patriarchy and uh, looking at its occurrence. Then we'll look at traditional explanations for patriarchy. Um, and as I'll point out, there really haven't been any directed at societal patriarchy. And then we'll talk about the male alliances and, and the summarize. Okay, so the a critical uh, key, I think, is to distinguish two types of patriarchy. In um, feminist philosophy, there's been a lot of worry about whether or not patriarchy is a useful word at all. And uh, up to about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I think a lot of people were just saying it's, it's not particularly useful because it covers such a multitude of sins. Uh, it um, uh, is not a universal unchanging feature. Uh, we need to dissect it somehow. But then uh, starting uh, in 2009 and uh, subsequently, uh, as, as I see it, uh, there's been increasing people willing to um, say that it's actually useful to divide the patriarchy into these two types. And so what are they? Defining domestic patriarchy. Um, here's Susan Rogers, informal relationships within the face-to-face -face community such that individual men dominate individual women. And uh, the critical point here uh, is that women's power is often uh, quite important. Uh, so Susan Rogers says it's at least as significant a force in everyday life as formalized, authorized relationships and power. Um, she talks about women's power being derived from three different things. She's looking cross-culturally. Uh, one is the relationships within the household. Another is the relationships that women have across households. And in some societies, uh, women can have um, uh, powers attributed to them uh, from the supernatural. So the result of this is that domestic relationships uh, include a wide range of relationships. If you just think about the people you know. Um, I, I mention here, uh, I give a, an example here from a particularly patriarchal society. I don't want to uh, sort of feed into a, a trope about um, particular society, but, but here is an example in this very patriarchal society of, of a man who, um, uh, uh, has the, the family pig killed and, and his wife is cross. And uh, so you see, he enters the house, she screams at him, uh, he shouts back, uh, there's a howl, he staggers out of the door, his wife is flailing at him with a firebrand. Uh, she smashes him on the top of the head, knocking him to his knees, takes a look at him, whirls around and stalks back into the house. Just to emphasize that in very, very patriarchal societies, you can have relationships that are not patriarchal from the point of view of what's going on within that particular household. Here's uh, an example from uh, John Wesley in the uh, early 18th century, um, by now the leader of 150,000 Methodists, uh, you know, big poobah leader, uh, and um, he was totally enthralled to his wife, uh, at one time uh, being seen dragging him by his hair uh, through the house and so on. So I just want to emphasize that when we talk about patriarchy as uh, a feature of humans, we're not talking about Every man dominates every woman. It's clearly not true. Uh, the CDC and others have reckoned that uh, at least one uh, in 10 men experience domestic uh, violence uh, from their wives. Um, here's uh, uh, Ernestine Friedel saying, women's status can be low in the public domain, but high even dominant rel relative to males in the domestic domain. So that's the point I want to make. And uh, this sums it up. But probably everywhere some wives dominate their husband. I, when I say everywhere, I, I mean every society on earth. Uh, and in that sense, domestic patriarchy is not a human universal. Societal patriarchy. Uh, I'm now following uh, Gwen Honeycutt, who had a very nice article about varieties of patriarchy. Uh, and uh, after her, I call it institutional arrangements that privilege males such that men as a group dominate women as individuals or as a group. And uh, it turns out that uh, you can find other people who have used this definition. Uh, so uh, I didn't realize that anyone had at the time I was developing this, but um, you see here uh, three other divisions which are essentially identical, I think. Um, to these two forms of patriarchy. So I want to say that societal patriarchy is a human universal. 
And uh, let me cite, first of all, a 1974 book on um, women, culture, and society, where the introduction says male as opposed to female activities are always recognized as predominantly important and cultural systems give authority and value to the roles and activities of men. And this is uh, a book uh, in which uh, all of the authors were women and uh, many of them very outspokenly feminist. So no one is saying this uh, out of pleasure. Um, here's Gerda Lerner uh, saying the same thing. Not a single society known where women as a group have decision-making power over men or where they define the rules of sexual conduct or control marriage exchanges. There are contemporary states, uh, we live in one, uh, where uh, in theory, there is pretty much uh, equal legal status uh, for uh, both genders. But as Catherine McKinnon writes here, uh, Although 184 of 194 countries have written constitutions guaranteeing gender equality, the reality of gender equality exists nowhere. So in practice, all important institutions in every society tend to be dominated by men, including law, religion, government, and business. There's lots of talk about nomadic hunters and gatherers, or some confusion, I would say. And it comes, I think, partly from uh, a quote like this from James Woodburn, uh, all nomadic hunter-gatherers are profoundly egalitarian, which makes it sound as though you wouldn't have societal patriarchy here. But then later in the same article, it's, I have exempted relations between men and women from the sweeping assertion. So he was talking just about relationships among men. And in fact, uh, there are disturbing and distressing uh, examples of uh, ways in which societal rules in hunters and gatherers benefit men at the expense of women. Uh, they control female sexuality in many ways. Uh, I mean, some, the extreme is marrying females as young as babies, but there's all sorts of marriage exchange uh, involving um, men. Adultery sanctions greater for women than men, deflowering virgins by ritual gang rape, menstruation seen as polluting. These are sort of fairly routine things. Coercing women for political purposes, being coerced into sex with uh, a man's, um, I don't know, a debtor or uh, uh, other reasons. Um, wife beating is often easily justified, such as if she's uh, failed as a cook. Uh, and uh, Transgressions by females are often resolved in uh, ways that uh, are clearly uh, highly unequal. Those are anecdotes, as it were, uh, scattered around different societies. Uh, Catherine Burnt was um, one of the great Australian ethnologists, and uh, she and her husband worked together, uh, but she was always very careful to um, ensure that people recognize the deg high degree of autonomy that women had, um, their um, considerable strong voices uh, that they could have. But nevertheless, um, she uh, wanted to draw attention to the fact that they're not equal in terms of political power. And she found three generalizations that applied to uh, the whole Australian ethnography, uh, and, uh, and they were these. So first of all, uh, the sanctions for discovering single gender secrets. So men and women could have secret societies. Secret societies were, were less developed or less frequent uh, for women, but when they happened, they were important and men were not allowed to go and discover the, see what's going on and what the women did. But uh, the way men could kill or gang rape women who discovered male secrets, and it was not true the other way around. Um, intergender coercion, uh, which uh, Catherine Byrne called cooperation, men would uh, coerce women into secret ceremonies to provide food and sex and dancing, and providing sex, uh, the women uh, say they lived in, in horror of these times because of what they were obliged to do. Women might have secret ceremonies, but they certainly couldn't coerce men. And I uh, one of the ways in which the ceremonies happened, uh, and not secret ceremonies, uh, were intertribal gatherings, and um, they were organized by um, men, and women 
could not do that. So those are the three generalizations for Australia. Australia is, uh, I think, a good representation of hunters and gatherers. It's uh, a place where uh, they're basically uh, the land of hunter gatherers uh, prior to the Europeans arising. They had agriculture like um, foraging, <clears throat> but uh, th this was where we see most hunter gatherer adaptations on Earth. But in fact, you see uh, something very similar to this uh, throughout, and I can't go through all the eth ethnographies of hunters and gatherers to sustain that claim. But it fits in with what uh, the 1974 publication said. Males are always the locus of cultural value everywhere, from those societies we might want to call most egalitarian to those in which sexual stratification is most marked. Men are the locus of cultural value. Some area of activity is always seen as exclusively or predominantly male and therefore overwhelmingly and morally important. The corollary is that everywhere men have authority over women, that they have a culturally legitimated right to her subordination and compliance. And for the feminist anthropologists who are writing this, of course, that raises all sorts of puzzles about why this is true. And one of the puzzles is that it's much more extreme than you find in primates on the whole. So males in non-human primate species, uh, they're not always socially dominant to females. Uh, even when they're bigger than females, they're not necessarily socially dominant as uh, famously in bonobos. And they don't control females that much. They don't control their movements. They don't control access uh, to resources. And Barbara Smuts, in a, in a brilliant analysis of the origins of patriarchy, looking at humans compared to primates in great detail, uh, emerged with this question. Why is it that human male dominance is so much more pervasive and elaborate than male dominance in other species? So that is the um, question that we'll just now look at through traditional explanations. I think that this, what I described as a key, namely the separation of patriarchy into domestic patriarchy and societal patriarchy, um, is a really big issue for answering the question of why is it that humans are so much more elaborate in the pattern of patriarchy than in non-human primates. Because even though you have a number of people who have discussed the fact that it is useful conceptually to divide patriarchy into these two types, Nevertheless, I'm not aware of anybody who has actually addressed them separately from the point of view of trying to understand why they occur. So not discussed separately by theorists, societal patriarchy, despite the fact that as we've seen, it's universal, obviously it depends on institutions, and it's a very strong predictor of women's subordination. Now, you know, I'm saying it's useful to separate these conceptually, I've got strong arrows uniting these here together because obviously they're very closely influencing each other. Uh, the uh, societal patriarchy um, will uh, uh, give a man uh, a sense of license uh, that he needn't be too worried if he beats his wife, perhaps. Uh, the, the men who uh, uh, wish to dominate their wives uh, are gonna be the men who contribute to defining and organizing societal patriarchy. So I'm not suggesting that these are completely independent, they're not, but nevertheless, uh, they are different in the ways that we've described. So I'm gonna say that there are three major theories um, and the most popular, the most uh, uh, common in the literature is the idea that male-male competition for uh, females leads to males controlling females, uh, which, generates within the household of a male who achieves this, uh, a, a domineering relationship with his wife. And then uh, that generates societal patriarchy because um, the men reproduce in society as a whole, the relationships that they have found uh, suit them within the household. So this goes right back to um, John Stuart Mill and Engels and, and all sorts of other people. Um, here is, uh, I think, one of the great theorists uh, of this area, uh, Catherine McKinnon, uh, saying the sphere called private, the domestic, has been extensively found to be a, perhaps the, crucible of gender inequality, notably 
of the patriarchal family, and then labor stratification, feminization of poverty, denial of reproductive control, by now we're in institutional areas, and male dominant stereotypical sexual practices and rape ringed with rape myths rationalized as love or culture. So she's putting it all together, but it starts in that view with, with domestic patriarchy. And various kinds of explanations are offered for domestic patriarchy happening, which as we saw is not a universal. Um, men are bigger than females on the left, uh, males are more aggressive than females, uh, females are tied by giving birth, um, but there are various kinds of objections to these uh, suggestions. Um, with regard to physical strength, people point out that some men are, are relatively frail compared to their wives. Uh, some women are very strong, but they don't end up necessarily uh, in a dominant position. Uh, bonobos undermine that because uh, you have bonobos being often dominant to males and yet not as strong as the males. And similar uh, problems with all of these. And the, the essential kind of problem is that you know, these may indeed contribute to what's going on in particular household relationships and so on, um, but other species have these phenomena. And so uh, these kinds of uh, possible explanations are, are not in a position to explain human exceptionalism, and they don't address the problem that I'm identifying as important, which is societal patriarchy. I'm not suggesting that domestic patriarchy isn't important. I'm just saying this is, this is a question for today. The second kind of explanation is um, that uh, when we go to war, uh, then alliances are needed among males and uh, females may find these uh, alliances actually useful and attractive uh, because it helps uh, win the war. And uh, so those male, male alliances end up uh, being responsible for some kind of blurred uh, relationship between domestic and societal patriarchy. And uh, there's certainly evidence that uh, this is important in, in some ways. Uh, here's an example from uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, where uh, it was observed that uh, when warfare was suppressed, then uh, you had a great reduction in the degree of patriarchy. Men began sleeping with their wives instead of being in the men's house where all sorts of uh, political organization happened that wasn't necessarily good for the women. Sacred flutes are burned and men's houses are largely abandoned and so on. And that's just one example of a much more general um, phenomenon that has been documented very nicely here by uh, Valerie Hudson and her colleagues in this wonderful book, The First Political Order, where they've taken a tremendous amount of data from um, uh, every country in the world that has more than 200,000 people in it um, and, uh, and put all, all those data into a series of uh, uh, correlations. And uh, you see here something that it looks like uh, basically war, violence and the instability factor uh, on the um, vertical axis in relationship to an index of patriarchy. And, and you see an astonishingly a strong relationship so that uh, where you get more violence and male-male alliances are needed to control the violence, then uh, you have more patriarchy. And which way around the relationship goes uh, is not stated, of course. So I think there's a convincing correlation that uh, when you have more male-male alliances, then you have more uh, patriarchy. But uh, there are other species, such as chimpanzees, that uh, have male alliances in war, and, and actually bonobos, uh, but they don't use those alliances to dominate females. And there's no reason in principle why they should do so. Uh, and in fact, you can uh, suggest reasons why uh, they even might not. So it raises a question, again, why are humans exceptional? And the question of exceptionality was addressed by Bob Smuts, uh, she said that um, the way to think about patriarchy is of ma males uh, attempting to exert reproductive control over females. And uh, since that ultimate goal uh, is the one, then the re way to explain human exceptionalism is to think about what is it that gives human males more gender power, more power over females uh, than in most species. And she drew attention to uh, in, in great uh, detail, uh, six uh, different possibilities, uh, all of which she felt were contributing, importantly. 
low female support from kin, males controlling critical resources, so a few men having a tremendous amount of power. Uh, the fact that females actually like dominant males because uh, they can protect them and give them more resources. Uh, language enabling uh, gender ideology to be um, perpetuated. And male-male uh, alliances being exceptionally well-developed. And basically, I think that, that uh, in this uh, remarkable uh, paper, which has withstood 25 years of time very, very well, um, she's got it right but she doesn't address societal patriarchy directly. And it doesn't, uh, it, it's not quite clear exactly uh, what is going on. So my perspective is that um, a lot has been achieved in understanding the sources of patriarchy, but we don't have any clear explanations for this um, persistent occurrence of societal patriarchy. Uh, here is a historian uh, saying well, it's likely there's some universal biological reason why almost all cultures valued manhood over womanhood. We don't know what this reason is. There are plenty of theories, none of them convincing, and you can find various quotes like that uh, in the literature about patriarchy. Okay, so I would now want to um, suggest that we can take a, a new tack uh, on this question, uh, thinking about the source of male alliances. And the tax starts with asking the question, uh, where does societal patriarchy come from? Uh, so here was the definition, you remember, institutional arrangements that privilege males such that men as a group dominate women as individuals or as a group. And uh, where does that come from? Um, well, institutional arrangements are the key. And the institutional arrangements, uh, I want to suggest that are critical is the law because the law arbitrates disputes. That's the ultimate decider when people have some kind of conflict within their society. And so that means that if male interests are tending to win over female interests, they are doing so because of the way the law is organized. So the question is, why is the law biased in favor of males? I think if we can answer that question, we can explain societal patriarchy. So I want to propose that the law has evolved as a system of alliances among males. And maybe this is a leap too far for you, but I'll try and justify it, that it begins with uh, that initial uh, set of alliances that I spoke about yesterday to kill the alpha male, which means we go back to 300,000 years ago. And in order to sustain this idea, uh, I'll, I'll ask whether or not law is a cultural universal. Uh, is it always dominated by males? Uh, do males uh, monopolize the ultimate resolution of the conflict, which is to kill those who are too much of a nuisance for society? And do they benefit uh, by benefits that the law distributes to the group as a whole, or as well as by subordinating females, as well as, by the way, other males. So you can imagine, I'm going to answer yes to all these questions. So is there always law? Well, amazingly, this was not an agreed um, topic uh, only 50 years ago, something like that. Because if you define law by codes and rules that are written down and so on, uh, then it's only a few thousand years old. And people used to say, well, law was invented by the Sumerians. But the um, great uh, legal anthropologist, uh, Leopold Pospisil, who died at the age of 98 uh, in, I think it was November or October, uh, he found otherwise. He said procedural law is a human universal. So this is law based on norms principles from rules and precedents that settle conflicts. He did field work with the Nuremut, as well as in Papua New Guinea. Uh, he surveyed uh, 95 societies, including a bunch of hunters and gatherers. And I don't see any challenge to his conclusions. He said, law is universal when defined as being manifested in a decision made by a political authority. 
containing a definition of the relationship between the two parties to the dispute. If the decision has a supposedly universal application, not just for one case, and enforceable decisions, which is ultimately made possible by violence by an authorized subgroup within a larger group. So law is everywhere. All societies have law. And it's always dominated by males. And we've already seen that societal patriarchy is always there. That means that the institutions are dominated by men. The political authority may not be easily defined, but in fact, when the discussion comes down to it, even though women may have a strong voice, it is the male elders who ultimately can be expected to wield the authority. And the elders does not necessarily mean men who are in their dotage. Uh, these are, are very often middle-aged or um, those who've got small children. It's certainly males that uh, regularly control the acts of execution when the conflicts come down to that. Uh, women have been documented uh, carrying out executions. Uh, I have only found two cases, and uh, in one, uh, the, uh, there was an incest taboo that was broken, and uh, the males killed the husband and uh, females killed the wife. And uh, in another, uh, the males uh, instructed females uh, to kill, and you see this described here, uh, an aggressively promiscuous man had incestuous intercourse and the warriors of three communities convened and agreed on his death and then the women were ordered to take him into the bush and do horrendous things to him, uh, which involved killing him. And then do the lawyers, do, is the result of the law, uh, the expected combination of benefits. Benefits, first of all, to the group as a whole. Well, yes, you know, you can say that uh, this is from our society, of course, um, but law does various great things to promote the smooth organization and workings of um, the society. And that's, I'm sure, true everywhere. But also it works to subordinate females. And it's only very recently in, uh, in the West that uh, there were laws allowing marital rape, uh, giving greater leniency for husbands killing their wives than vice versa, criminalizing prostitutes but not the Johns, uh, giving males greater status in all sorts of ways. And um, just in case you, you, you think that everything's changed, uh, not everything has changed. So here's an example, the Violence Against Women Act, um, which was uh, uh, fought for uh, from the 1990 onwards, and after four years, uh, it was passed. And it supposedly gave women a federal civil right to be free of gender motivated violence. And then uh, the 21st case that was brought before it, US versus Morrison, um, a rape case, um, the Supreme Court uh, decided that uh, it was not appropriate for women to bring this case to the federal level. Why? Because well, the federal level is supposed to regulate interstate commerce. And the Violence Against Women Act didn't have implications for interstate commerce, which feminist lawyers have strongly objected to because there's all sorts of implications for uh, interstate commerce um, in terms of uh, uh, what women are suffering. But nevertheless, it was ruled by five to four to be not a federal issue. And the Violence Against Women Act, uh, in uh, the opinion of Diane Rosenfeld, is now a toothless act. Then, uh, in addition to subordinating females, uh, is there a case that uh, unallied males are subordinated? And uh, I mentioned yesterday that uh, executions uh, tend to be more of males than females. Here is uh, uh, another example of that across different societies, that witches, who are the ones who are most likely to be executed, uh, are uh, more likely to be male than female in the majority of societies. Um, the, uh, oh, I, I, I meant to uh, add there that um, uh, I think it's very clear that uh, the law tends to benefit uh, from this, oh, 
tends to uh, act at the expense of not only women, but also a bunch of men who are not in the category of the type of men who are typically engaged in practicing and carrying out the law. And that, of course, involves men of various different class and race and uh, other kinds of practice. So male bias in the law, uh, I think, is a human universal. We've been through these uh, four points, uh, A to D. And uh, so I want to suggest that uh, this supports the uh, execution hypothesis or the TCK hypothesis, or TCK refers to targeted conspiratorial killing, which enabled execution to be possible. Um, and that uh, we have uh, a um, from uh, what I think self-domestication evidence points to going starting at 300,000 years ago, where a male alliance with the power to kill judiciously uh, can imprison or kill violent men leading to uh, self-domestication. Uh, it can uh, set selfish group norms leading to what we might call civility, what Sigmund Freud would call civility, and uh, to societal patriarchy through subordinating females and and allied males. So the hypothesis to be explicit is that law is the direct descendant of the beta male alliances that conspired to kill the alpha males. From that time in the Pleistocene, we don't know exactly when, to the present, the male alliances have used their power of life and death over everyone in the group to serve the selfish goals of the beta males. And law thus generates both group benefits and societal patriarchy. In support of that, or consistent with it at least, I would say that it remains the case cross-culturally that the primary concern of the law is control of violent males who are rivals to the lawmakers. Um, in thinking about the justification for this you know, rather big claim, I suppose, that the law now is the descendant of what happened 300,000 years ago, I would say that if in fact male alliances did emerge 300,000 years ago and had the effects that we've said, then it's hard to imagine why they would ever give up that power. Once they evolved the ability to control others, how could they ever give it up? Only if it was taken from them. I'd say a very important point here is that males tend to be united with each other in uh, these endeavors because to be considered a non-conformist male is dangerous. Now, that's probably easier to imagine in small-scale societies where the male that says, you know, I don't think it's that nice to put, you know, this woman to death for whatever it was that was said. Uh, the danger is that by breaking with the male consensus, that male puts himself in a position of being an outcast and therefore on the road to possible execution. So it's easy for me to imagine that that kind of dynamic still applies today, that men are less willing to support what in theory they might be willing to support in terms of equal gender rights because they don't want to be seen as a wuss by their male colleagues uh, as part of a an ancient system of invoking fear towards cementing male alliances. So in short, I think that the conflicts, when you get conflicts between females and males, they become moral problems for males, because from the male point of view, the moral system is it's right to do what the male alliance says is right. Of course, I, you know, one of the kind of nice features about this way of thinking is that it emphasizes by focusing on societal patriarchy as the product of an institutional arrangement, um, it emphasizes that it can be changed. It's not exactly uh, something that we need to have emphasized because we see that law is changed. We see there have been incredibly dramatic changes in the last hundred years, such as those I mentioned. We're not allowed, husbands are not allowed to rape their wives now in this country. 
So clearly the male bias can be reduced and it doesn't seem any reason why it shouldn't be reduced a whole lot further. But nevertheless, it's not just a question of de jure uh, equality in the eyes of the law, because it's also got to be de facto. The law has actually got to be implemented in a way that is equal to men and women. So in um, summary, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I want to be clear. Um, I'm saying societal and domestic patriarchy are different, uh, that there have been no canonical explanations for societal patriarchy, but it is a human universal. I'm predicting that it began 300,000 years ago. I have no idea how you're going to test that one, I admit, um, but it seems to me helpful to, to conceive of it that way. Um, and I think that if we think of it that way, then it explains the uh, species-wide male bias in the law. It explains human exceptionalism compared to other primates. It gives us a scenario of the origin, beginning in the violence of males against males, not of males against females. And I think it's supported uh, with the evidence I presented yesterday about self-domestication. It's consistent with the evolution of groupishness. And even if you don't buy any of that stuff, um, I think it draws attention to a gender issue. And that is what uh, Carol Pateman, among others, has drawn attention to as uh, the fact that theories routinely ignore or downplay the impact of gender, despite the fact that the enforcement of moral and social norms is by males. And uh, I see some examples here uh, in my own area. Um, so, uh, in biological anthropology uh, and evolutionary psychology, people are fascinated by the question of the evolution of hypercooperation in humans. And Joe Henrik and Michael Muthukrishna have a 2021 article uh, in Annual Review of Psychology, The Origins and Psychology of Human Cooperation. They never mention the word gender, sex, male or female. It's all in the cognitive level. I think it's a very important part. And one of the arrows I showed yesterday said, yeah, you know, this contributes. But to ignore gender, when you see that there is so much enforcement by males of moral issues related to cooperation, seems to me a major omission. And even the wonderful Chris Boehm, in uh, his analysis of the evolution of morality via norm enforcement, he very much downplayed the notion that males, females were importantly different in this respect. And Carol Pateman has uh, drawn attention to uh, the sort of story in political philosophy. Uh, she refers to the political fiction of the universal civil individual, um, that uh, uh, people act as though uh, the uh, uh, enlightenment theories of Rousseau and others are applying equally to uh, men and women, but actually when you look at what's going on, they don't. They apply to men and then men are expected to just go off and get their wives. And the law. I mean, the law is a fascinating area, you know, because as Carol Pateman says, uh, the way that you have uh, the law analyzed from a theoretical perspective ignores males. That is to say, it ignores the fact that males are more involved than females. We've just seen how incredibly male biased the law is. Uh, she, Carol Payment, draws attention to the fact that Rawls constructs his theory of justice uh, without reference to gender. And the wonderful irony here is that there is supposed to be this tremendous female influence in law. The gods of ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, and ancient Greece, who represented justice, were women. It's a farce. There is a worthy tradition that would have us hear the judge as a voice of reason, see her, says Robert Cover, as the embodiment of principle. Are we trying to fool ourselves? Are we trying to give ourselves the sense that law is so even-handed that actually we don't need to think about male bias in it? I think that's what's happening. So Mary Astell's question, if, women are, if men are born free, how is it that women are born slaves? I'm suggesting that women are born slaves because throughout the history of Homo sapiens, men have allied with each other to monopolize the legitimate use of killing. 
and that substantiates the basis for the judicious uh, uh, behavior in relationship to all conflicts. But men have done so to maintain their safety from violent males. They settle disputes with females from a selfish point of view, of course. They have the power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And in doing this, the men discriminate against men outside the dominant class, whether they be homosexuals, Freemasons, other races, lower classes. And at the same time, they're producing laws that function to benefit a well-organized society. And we, as members of the society, look at the law and are grateful for that. And I think we forget the tremendous male bias that is part of it. So just coming back to themes introduced yesterday, um, I argued that uh, humans have something special. Uh, Homo sapiens in the middle row here are the species that has both groupishness and selfishness. Animals don't have groupishness and selfishness in general. Uh, and I argued that non-sapiens homo didn't have groupishness. Obviously, you get groupishness in the law uh, in the sense that the law is, um, it's not really groupishness in the way I defined it, but it's, it's uh, in the sense that it's benefiting society as a whole. Uh, but the law is selfish as well. And I suggested yesterday that, that uh, values can be divided into those that are selfish and those that are, are groupish. And in humans, we have this, this fascinating tension uh, I guess my main point here is to say that just as we have the tension within us individually, uh, in our internal motivations to be egoistic or to be altruistic, so there is a tension in the motivations of the law uh, and, uh, and our values. Uh, I, I showed this yesterday, the, the 10 core values that have been found to be most common uh, cross-culturally, and uh, that some of those are selfish and uh, some of those are groupish. So we have these tensions within us. Uh, I think that the result has been a very strange resolution in context of the law, because we have forgotten or we have downplayed the extent to which uh, uh, the law is a source of uh, selfish domination of uh, women and uh, unallied males. But it also is the case that if we think about the large scale evolution, I, I think looking at it this way helps us understand that the view that is often portrayed of humans as a basically delightful cooperative species that maybe added patriarchy with agriculture should be challenged by an alternative perspective that says that uh, our cooperation is tinctured with a classic kind of animal selfishness and that the dynamic that led to groupishness has also led to us being institutionally patriarchal since our origin giving us a history of this that is uh, dauntingly old, but nevertheless, quite open to change. Thank you. While you're coming up, Lisa, I'll just say uh, uh, thank you again to the organizers. Um, and uh, other discussants and multiple collaborators. <laughs>